Thank you. Okay, let's dive into the uh, this opening conference on New Horizons in Space. Uh, the panel, uh, as you can see on, on the screen, uh, Dennis Bushnell, who uh, virtually everybody I assume met last night, who, had, who was here for dinner. Um, his bio is long, you can, you can read it. Ariel Ekblom in, in the middle, uh, who is from the MIT Media Lab, where she is, as you see, is the founder and lead in something called the Space Exploration Initiative. I'll have her uh, give her a chance to tell us a little bit about that. Um, also in her bio is uh, what her current research is on. She is actually doing all of this while completing her PhD and uh, with a focus on uh, uh, self-assembling habitats in space. Uh, and then finally we have Chris Lewicki, who is the, currently the CEO of Planetary Resources, but before that was uh, program manager and other titles with the Mars Rovers programs. Essentially, he's probably been to Mars as much as anybody uh, in, in the world. Uh, uh, and, as far as uh, you can go with robots. As far as you can go with robots, so, so that's cool. So uh, let's, let's dive in. I, I will say, uh, for those of you who have not been at FIRE before, there are microphones in the, in the aisles. And when, the, when our clock gets to about five minutes or so, maybe a little bit before that, uh, we'll toss to questions from the audience. So about 20 after eight, if you have a question, uh, only a few uh, get in. If you have a question, you might want to come and stand in line at one of the microphones. Uh, and, uh, and be ready to, to put your question out. So let me, let me begin with Ariel, um, who, who I met at a, uh, another space conference. Uh, tell us about um, the space initiative uh, and, and a little bit about your research on, on expandable habitats. What, what are expandable habitats and, and who's going to use them, where and when, that kind of thing. Thanks, Glenn. And, 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 and Ariel oh. brought a video with her, and I'm going to give you the clicker, and we can Great. I'm going to click once and see what we got. Uh, I'll do the overview no, the explanation no. and then okay. we can go to the video. There we go. Great. Nice to meet you all. Thank you very much for having me here. Thanks, Glenn. I lead the Space Exploration Initiative at MIT Media Lab. For those of you who may not be familiar with the lab, it is an interdisciplinary R&D environment at MIT. 27 different research labs under one roof, everything from synthetic neurobiology, exploring CRISPR, to AI and data science, to sensors, art and architecture, all in one department. The mission of the Space Exploration Initiative was to be a launch pad across all of those different disciplines. So rather than saying going to AeroAstro or a traditional aerospace engineering path, can we enable a number of different faculty, staff, scientists, students, et cetera, to put their existing passions and their existing work into a space deployment context? So some of the work that I do is arrange launch contracts, SpaceX, Blue Origin, NanoRacks, et cetera, parabolic flights, which you'll see across this entire portfolio of research. We founded in 2016, and we're now a team of over 50 students, staff, and faculty, and we have 25 plus projects in the research portfolio. I had a couple of you come up to me already saying that you'd like to talk more about research. We're really open to collaboration, so I'd be happy to, to go further with you guys on that point. And then to your question about the self-assembling space architecture, this is my baby, this is my passion, and it is a proposal for a new modular architecture in orbit. If you think about the International Space Station, the way it was constructed, it is itself modular, but the, the units like Destiny module or um, the Russian modules, the Columbus module from ESA, are all fixed and rigid. And so instead of having to have that kind of a, a model for architecture, can you have self-assembling units that assemble quasi-stochastically? So the tiles themselves are packed flat, kind of like IKEA furniture in a rocket so you can fit a larger total volume once they're finally expanded and released, and that they self-assemble completely autonomously without the requirements for human EVAs, extravehicular activities from astronauts. Happy to talk more about that later as well. So, and, and what's, the, what's the video that, that, that you yes. brought? So I have a video to show you guys. It's two minutes, and it's an exploration of 14 of our different research projects that flew on a parabolic flight last fall, just, uh, just under a year ago. And we charter an entire parabolic flight just for the Media Lab, and we pack it full of 25 different researchers, 14 research projects across the gamut of those disciplines that you heard. And if we get a chance, I'd love to run that now so you guys can see the yeah, diversity of the research. If Scott could go ahead and show that, that would be good. for grappling onto asteroids of unknown topology, unknown shape and size. 
This is one of the first ever musical instruments designed uniquely for zero gravity. So you can't play this instrument on Earth or in a normal gravity environment. This is Sheng Lu looking at responsive suits in addition to mobility and zero G like a Spider Woman approach. This was an outreach project we did with 200 kids who submitted coded research projects. This is physiology sensing, looking at multiple arousal theory and skin capacitance, monitoring astronaut biometrics. This is work out of Cynthia Brazel's group at the Media Lab, looking at the future of personal robotics, social robotics, and how can you do human robotic interaction in the space context. This is Ed Boyden's group. He's our best bet for a Nobel Prize at the Media Lab currently. Uh, we're really hoping for him, and this is an exploration of neuroscience, small-scale micro labs in a zero-gravity environment. This is spatial flux, looking at pneumatically actuated tentacle-like embraces um, for sleeping bags and other applications. This is zero gravity 3D printing. It's UV cured resin. So those are UV curing lights that you see on the sides and we're exploring how to make perfectly spherical ball bearings lenses. This is looking at situational awareness in zero gravity. So virtual reality based or augmented reality based, how can you augment an astronaut's experience of space? This is an artistic project, looking at the smells of Earth and how do we maintain mental health and a connection to Earth for long duration space voyages. This is water templating, looking at surface tension dominating in fluids. And this is an early, early test of my PhD research, looking at that self-assembling um, electromagnet and pe uh, permanent magnet mediated research. And that is the vice president of research for MIT who joined us on the flight and did a genetic nanopore sequencer experience. And that's a fraction of the team. So, thank you. So, what, what, one, one quick follow-up question for you, and that is, when, when you started the initiative, did you, did you think that it would generate this much interest? So the question is really, I'm, I'm impressed with how much interest from students and faculty, what's driving all of that? Our vision for it was to be able to grow and make a, make a mark on the space industry going forward. One of the ways that we frame it is that Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and NASA and others are working on the rockets to get us there, wherever there may be, Mars and beyond. We are really passionate and excited about the human lived experience once we are in space, or perhaps the robotic lived experience, and thinking about that entire panoply of technologies that you'll want for something like a science fiction space future, but because we're at MIT, rigorously prototyped and, and realistic technologies. So. Okay. Good, okay. Let's go to Chris. Uh, Chris, Planetary Resources. Uh, why did it start? Where is it? Uh, and, and are we gonna go to asteroids? And why? Uh, all big questions. So good morning. Uh, happy to be here at FIRE again. Um, planetary Resources is a mining co company operating in space. And the, uh, the single thing I want you to take away from that is it's not about going to space to bring resources back to Earth. It's about developing the things that we will need in space so we don't have to bring everything with us. Uh, send just the good stuff and the irreplaceable things uh, and then get the rest of the raw materials from uh, the places that you're gonna go visit and, uh, and stay. Um, uh, so in doing that, we're uh, operating you know, like the com at the intersection of space, uh, technology, policy, uh, and then plain old simple mining. We're having to do a lot of the things that a normal mining company would have to do and, prospecting, exploration, development. Um, uh, since uh, I was last at FIRE, which I think was 2012 or 2013, maybe Mark remembers, um, I, I guess I'd just like to report the, the future is going very well. Uh, there's been, since I was, was last here, uh, you know, where there are now reusable rockets for multiple companies. Uh, we've landed on comets, asteroids, flown past Pluto, um, there's new rovers on Mars. Um, the uh, multiple governments have introduced legislation contemplating space resources and property ownership in space. Um, uh, it's just, you know, on a time scale of four, six, eight years, uh, there's a lot happening. And it's completely inverted in the way that we used to think about space as a government activity uh, related to national prestige and. Uh, political influence and things like that. Uh, and I think we're, we're in now into the second space age, which is more of an industrial space age. How do we have millions of people living and working in space, like Jeff Bezos wants to see uh, with his company, Blue Origin. So uh, our part in that is uh, you know, making it uh, something that you can do uh, scalable and sustainably, uh, and you can really do it without limit. So we don't have to contemplate we're running out of planets. Uh, we can just use new technologies to create new resources without limit. So what are the three biggest challenges to, to actually getting 
the company to asteroids and, and, and working with them? Uh, I, I think uh, there's a couple different challenges. It's not a technology challenge by any means. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's certainly not a challenge of are these things there? That's known uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt. We actually have a better idea of uh, the materials on, on asteroids than we do on the moon or Mars. Uh, because we have a lot more of them, they happen to rain down on the planet in the form of, of meteorites. Um, uh, the policy aspects of it used to be a challenge, uh, but I think uh, that has gotten to its next notch. It'll be another challenge in the future, uh, but it, it has, uh, uh, has been uh, upwardly mobile. Um, I think the, the two remaining challenges are really one of perception and then one of financing. This is a long duration, capital intensive, uh, somewhat risky uh, project. Uh, and you know, unlike a computer startup or an AI startup or a, a VR startup, you can't produce results and customers in, a, uh, in, a, in an industry base in three to five years. This is, again, going back to a typical mining project, it's an eight, 12, 15 year project. Uh, so, so that's uh, one of the things that's a challenge. I also think, uh, you know, speaking in a group of, of future-minded folks who are certainly well-versed in technology, is because of the success of uh, our exploration and technology in space to date, we have this perception that there's a right, best way to do it. And that's the way that we should do it. Um, and that's really nice if you can do that. Uh, but I, I think what's more important is that uh, no one really knows what the answer is, so lots of tries are appropriate. And in my mind, whatever barely gets the job done uh, and is cheap and simple, and replicable and can be done by a lot of different folks, that's probably the best way. Uh, even if it doesn't look anything like your science fiction uh, or what the latest NASA research was. Uh, and that's really the difference between fundamental research and you know, applied science is, is just trying to find the way uh, that this is something you can actually get started. And you know, how do you start that fire and get it going? How do you catalyze it? Uh, so that perception issue of like, should we go to the moon, Mars, asteroids, should we stop all together? Um, the first three, not the last one, uh, are the uh, what I'm a proponent yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of NASA, let's let's turn to Dennis. Um, Dennis, uh, going to the moon? Yeah. Uh, the moon is a place where we can devalue some of the things I'm going to discuss. Uh, what I'd like to do now is briefly go through in a little bit more detail some of the stuff I discussed last night, particularly. You know, the human health and space issues, which are really a stopper to all this. Look, we're making progress, but it's not going to be cheap. But Musk is enabling us to do it with this factor of 14, cheaper space access, and making Mars the Walmart for the inner solar system. So first, the health issues. The effects of radiation are carcinogenesis, DNA damage, immune system degeneration, cardiovascular damage, neurological damage, and digestive system damage. The effects of microgravity are skeletal, musculator, uh, DNA damage, immune system degeneration, cardiovascular, neurological, eyes especially, and liver damage. The dust in the moon Mars, particularly Mars, Mars dust has 10,000 times the perchlorates that you have on Earth, and that takes down your thyroid flat. Uh, so you have to stay away from the dust and you have to keep it out of the hab and so forth and so on. Uh, the Mars, Mars and moon dust is small, sharp, oxidative, severe respiratory and cardiopulmonary effects. Uh, the current sit rep with respect to human health is that we've been putting since the early OOs uh, uh, people up on station for six months and that's about what humans can take with residual effects on the eyes and some others when they come back. Kelly went up for one year and said, no, 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 this is far worse. Uh, Kelly came back, his skin had not been touched much in a year. The skin degenerated into inflamed neurons, really painful to walk and so forth. It took him quite a while to get better. So Mars, which is a three year, if we go chemical, needs artificial gravity, some think, and also three plus meters of polyethylene as an overcoat to protect from radiation. And that overcoat, which is reusable, uh, would uh, weigh just about as much as the rest of the spacecraft. So we need much more fuel to push it there and back. And that's where the factor of 14 cheaper mass and low Earth orbit comes from. 
Uh, on the moon and Mars, you'd have to live under three, no, four meters of regolith or ice. Or, uh, as I said last night, this nuke battery driving Vazimir at 6,000 seconds of ISP, we can do Mars round trip in uh, 200 days fast transits, and that's like six months on station. Humans, to keep them pink and warm, and because their equipage is not reducing in size and weight much, everything in space is miniaturizing, all right? The problem is the humans are not. So all of their equipage scales mainly with their size, and therefore, humans cost a factor of at least 500 times more than autonomous robotics. So the bottom line is with respect to humans in space. AI is getting much better. Uh, the capability to machine ID8 is coming along. The robotics going forward will be both less expensive and possibly more capable than humans with respect to commercial space. What is a separate issue is Mars colonization to hedge the bets to the human species from the odd asteroid impact. This is not a commercial space issue. This is a let's save the species issue. Uh, Mars will probably be colonized. Mars can be colonized now, as I'll indicate. We're working on biological countermeasures uh, to reduce the health effects, uh, particularly for radiation. And we're making some progress on this. Uh, there's no reason why, with uh, the bio business and some time on Mars, humans couldn't evolve into Martians, the ones that survive. Uh, but the return to Earth would be TBD. The cartoons of astronauts in holy radiation ineffective spacesuits wandering around outside playing golf and other things and living in thin surface habs that are not radiation protective are just not accurate. You know, you, you know you've all seen uh, the cartoons on this stuff. All right, making Mars the Walmart for the inner solar system. We could colonize Mars, Moon, the upper surface of Venus, uh, upper atmosphere of Venus, and the poles of Mercury along with Titan, uh, which is a moon of Saturn and has an absolutely magnificent, thick uh, hydrocarbon atmosphere. The supplies, equipage, finished products, and resources to do all of this are essentially available uh, by in situ resource utilization on Mars and could produce, be produced pre-human arrival by autonomous robotics and printing where the coffee is parking before the humans leave Earth. Mars has huge amounts of water in ice lakes the size of Lake Huron and twice as deep. There's ice in the, in the regolith, you just microwave it, and uh, a lot of ice, uh, ice chemically bound, a lot of water chemically bound, enough, as I said last night, to put a very deep ocean on the whole bloody planet. From the atmosphere, you cool the surface, you precipitate out CO2. So you have H, O, and C, which means you not only have all the fuels you want, methane and hydrogen oxygen, but all the plastics that you want. And we can now make just about anything the humans would need, whether it's rovers, whether it's furniture, whether it's, it's anything, okay, from, you know, plastics. And, and, and the atmosphere actually has some nitrogen in it for breathing. There's at least 20 minerals in the Martian regolith, including a lot of magnesium. And so we can use magnesium CO2 rockets for transportation. The Martian topography is not thought to be conducive to on-surface transport to any appreciable distance. The energy we use is either terrestrial or space solar and also fission nukes. There's excellent ongoing bio, SID bio research for bio mining, bio food, biomaterials, bioplastics, and composites, and this is advancing very well. So we term all of this ISRU, in situ resource utilization, and we have, since we've worked this seriously the last, since 14, changed within the agency, NASA, ISRU from a hobby shop into Earth independence, yes, we can do it, okay? <laughs> uh, and uh, the resources and techs to do this are essentially there. Uh, it's becoming both more affordable and safer as we go through this Martian colonization. It's coming, it's coming, okay. Um, 
Now, what is what are, what are you doing at MIT around the around the human the human factors and sort of human survival? Yeah. You mentioned the, the the film, the psychological stuff. Give yeah. us uh, a to couple of things you're working on there. Of the yeah. Points that Dennis made. One is the the interest in synthetic biology and the being the ability to tune a genome. And so most of our work that you guys saw in the video is maybe three to five to ten years out. It's meant to be practical in the near term. Some of the projects that we're looking at that are maybe 10, 25, 50 years further out, are trying to answer this issue of genetic preparedness and, and um, health robustness. So if you um, are familiar with tardigrades, water bears, has anybody heard of tardigrades or water bears? They have this interesting genetic property called cryptobiosis. And one of the research groups in the media lab, in collaboration with some folks at Harvard, are interested in looking at tardigrades and this property and trying to analyze, can you reverse engineer it into ever larger organisms? So the first step would be just be to be able to go from tardigrades to mice. Now, the reason we'd want to do this is tardigrades are resilient to radiation, to extremes of desiccation, to temperature swings. They basically often live in, in marshes, so areas where they're experiencing quite a, a drastic change in their environment. Now, as Dennis will tell you, this is years and years away from being practical in humans. There are huge ethical questions to answer about genetically engineering humans, but I think it is an interesting question to address. Can we flip the paradigm, whereas instead of always sending Earth-based organisms, whether they're human life or other, out into space in an Earth-like environmental bubble, can you prepare those organisms themselves to be more space tolerant for a, a deep space future? That's one of the things that we're looking at. Okay. Chris, what's, what's the number one challenge to um, uh, becoming spacefaring on Earth. What's the number one challenge that we have to solve on Earth in order to be uh, Well, we're seeing today, I think, uh, the, the biggest challenge, which is getting there, uh, is being incrementally uh, improved. Um, you know, certainly reusability. We don't throw our aircraft away every time we use them, and now we don't throw our rockets away every time we use them, at least not all of them. Um, uh, so that's getting better. Uh, I think another thing, this is a mindset issue. I think people think about mass migration of the entire planet into space. And that's not going to happen. Um, you know, the, as, uh, as, uh, Jeff, Jeff Bezos gives lots of talks on his thoughts of space. And I always like, if we explored all the planets now, and we can confirm the Earth is the best one. Uh, so uh, you know, I think first and foremost, it's about understanding uh, and maintaining the environment on Earth from our evolved biology and our technology that's, a, that's addressing that, but figuring out how to adapt space environment to our own biology and adapt, as Ariel just said, ourselves to space. Uh, or you know things that we'd like to go there. So um, uh, some of Dennis's comments made me think about uh, a d debate among the space community of uh, a topic called planetary chauvinism. Uh, you know we seem to like horizons and uh, terra firma or uh, Mars affirma or Moon affirma, to, depending on your proper use of the Latin. Um, but you know we can build skyscrapers. The city of Tokyo is an example of an urban landscape that is almost entirely artificial. Uh, there's no reason why we can't have, you know, a, a, a 10 million people living in space colonies where you can adapt the environment exactly to your liking. Instead of uh, the gradations of gravity being a threat, they become a tool uh, and you have access to them whenever you want. Uh, and the whole planet doesn't need to do that, but if 10,000 people want to go and do that, that would be pretty interesting for, uh, well, certainly pretty interesting for those people. But uh, I think more interesting for the diversity of the human experience and research and findings, uh, I think uh, I have this theory that I think a lot of the breakthroughs uh, in uh, the, the settlement and development of space is going to be in the wait staff and the future space hotels. Uh, because when they're off shift, they're going to be in the best <laughs> research environment, better than the best MIT lab. Uh, and it's just after they're done with their day job, uh, they can go on to uh, their night job doing fundamental research for the future of the human civilization in space. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take questions from the audience in about a minute and a half, and uh, I'm gonna give you each a, a 30 second question. So we're on, we're on the uh, occasion of 50 year anniversaries. 50 years ago, 2001 Space Odyssey movie this year. Uh, 50 years ago, I think just December moonrise, or Earthrise over the moon, right? Uh, next summer, first landing on, on the moon. Uh, 50 years from now, in 30 seconds, uh, where do you want us to be? Chris, we'll just come down the road from Chris to, uh, to uh, Ariel. Uh, 50 years from now is two generations-ish. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I want to be in uh, a place where uh, people see you know, all these futures and all these possibilities as inevitable. Uh, some of them have come to pass. Some of the good ideas are still tantalizingly out of reach. Uh, but I, I, I think I'd, 
from a resource standpoint, whether you know it's measured in watts, kilograms, uh, or parts per million of, of trace gases, um, I guess I want us to be in abundance in all of that uh, and figuring out how to enjoy it all. Okay, Ariel? So I'd love to see on a very concrete standpoint, maybe a 10 person or more subsistence colony on the moon. There's been an interesting study in 2014 that NASA Ames did that said for maybe two to $5 billion, it's not out of the question that we'd be able to establish a subsistence colony. So something that's no longer dependent on Earth. I'd love to see human presence on Mars, even if it's not subsistence, because we haven't maybe yet solved the, the duration of life in that radiation environment. And I'd love to see us thinking where we are now, pushing out to maybe human missions on Mars, pushing out to human missions uh, to Europa, or landers, clippers, other um, planned projects for some of the interesting exoplanets that are out there. Okay. Dennis, where do you want us to be in 50 years? That's a hard question. The easier one is where we probably will be in 50 years. And uh, we will be in 50 years far along becoming cyborgs which will help the space business. Uh, if we can go through the climate and other problems, uh, the O'Neill colonies that he mentioned and so forth, this stuff is all hideously expensive. And the initial stuff that I worked for Mars for the past six, uh, six seven years is we started out with Mars being uh, uh, safe and affordable, in turn, uh, you know, including reliability, was was the question. And we started out with what's affordable is not safe, and what's safe is not affordable. Okay, and, and so we first had to get the cost down to afford safety. Okay, and all the safety stuff was all of this business with the human health effects. And the more data we got off a station, this was going south. Okay. So we need to fix the health. I want us to be, to, to have the health squared away, okay? Let's stop there, let's stop and there. And I want it to be affordable. Okay, health fixed, affordable. Any, any questions from any of you? We gotta be quick. Hello. I don't know how you can answer this question, but it's, it's one of the one, most important ones for me, which is why are you doing this? Not, you know, and go deep. <laughs> so 50, I, I'm, I'll take one, I'll give you a little, little hint. Um, Space Odyssey ends with the star child looking back at Earth. Uh, everybody thought that was quite mysterious uh, and had a hard time interpreting that. If you, if you read the stories of making that movie, which by the way, only took two years less, after the Kennedy announcement than actually going to the moon. Um, Kubrick and, and uh, Clark were very clear. They said, in order for the human species to evolve, we had to come out of the sea. And in order for the next species to evolve, we have to leave uh, this planet. That was, that was their uh, yeah. belief. I'd say the, the planet is an artificial boundary. Uh, and the, the why of this is it's encoded in a lot of our DNAs to, to explore find new areas of wonder, find new challenges, uh, and pursue them, and sometimes overcome them. Uh, and that's not for everybody, but it's for a part of us, and that has uh, served us well to a point, and we need to overcome these artificial boundaries for it to continue to serve us well. And that's why, that's my why. Okay. I feel the same. It's a, a calling. It's something that I think humans are uniquely suited to do, and there's something beautiful and captivating about the idea of humans exploring and pushing beyond the Earth. I think for those people that that same answer doesn't speak to them as compellingly, maybe they read less sci-fi when they were growing up, there are other economic benefits that could be made to those people. So the benefit of exploration deep into space for the sake of knowledge itself, all that we've learned about the universe, for the sake of resources, as Chris could speak to even better than I can, and eventually maybe also for the sake of spin-offs. There's been a long tradition of NASA spin-offs that have profoundly come back down to benefit life on Earth, and maybe that is one of the side benefits that we'll be able to obtain as we push out for philosophical reasons further out into the universe. Dennis, why, why on a deeper level? Why, why go? Why go? Why, why, why do anything in space on a deeper level? You know, uh, I did an op for Golden when he was administrator on uh, why go? Okay. And we argued for six months about this. And the two 
solid ones are national prestige and hedging the bets for the species for the odd asteroid impact. After that, it gets really weak, particularly with respect to humans. The, the commercial space stuff is fine. Uh, manufacturing in space and all the other things I went through last night, uh, you know, these are good business things and so forth to do. Uh, it's the human thing that's the issue, okay? Because as I said, humans are 500 to perhaps as much as 1,000 more expensive than, than, than you know, doing it with robots, particularly as the robots have kept getting much, much better. Okay, all right. We have one, uh, let's take one more question. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about economics and uh, the concept of capital on Mars. And uh, once we get there, you know, there's been a tremendous investment to, to get there and make things happen. But if we have an unlimited set of resources, uh, have you done any studies about what that ch changes in terms of economic models of operating while you are uh, building a, a, a new planetary society? We kind of have to have a yes or no answer to that <laughs> and, and, and talk to them after the break. Yeah. Y yes, we have done studies like that or... This one? Yeah. Yes. Have, have not, I don't think studies? that's a space question. Uh, yeah. I, I think yeah. that's a society Actually, question. Actually, that, that's not a bad segue to... <laughs> yeah. um, at four, from four to five today are breakout sessions. Ariel is uh, leading a, a breakout session. I'll be there to assist her. And the question is going to be, um, suppose you solve the technical questions, you go out and, and, and develop settlements in space. How do you build a society, including an economy? So that will actually be a very good place to talk about that. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the panel. Uh, it was great. And uh, we're on to the next thing.